We've already covered fine tuning if you want structured responses like arrays or JSON objects. Today, we'll be fine tuning for style or tone on a Shakespeare data set. Note that Llama is already pretty familiar with Shakespeare because it's so widely disseminated on the internet. So we won't see that much improvement in the text, although you'll see that we get quite an improvement in the validation loss. However, in your case, you'll be using ideally your own novel data set, or at least your own novel way of fine tuning Llama for a certain tone or style. I'll put a link to a free Google Collab notebook below, but you can purchase access to the Llama fine tuning repository to get access to the exact scripts I'm running today. This repository has got a script for tuning for tone or style, just as we're going through today. And it also has a script that will allow you to fine tune for structured responses, which I covered in a previous video. Opened up the fine tuning script in a Google Collab Notebook. This can be run in a free Collab Notebook using a T4. Just go to runtime, then go to change runtime type. You can select uh, T4. Uh, even if you're on free, you can just select GPU. Uh, you don't even need high RAM, so I'll click save. Now I'm going to use the Meta 7B model as a default. That is a gated model, although you can find um, an ungated version. I'll put a link in the description below. But since I'll go with the gated one, I'll click here just to log into Hugging Face. Now, let's see. I've just clicked on this button here to initiate notebook login. This will allow me access to gated um, repositories like Meta. I'm connected up here. I'm going to just copy a token, paste that in, and click login. Now, for the rest of the steps, I'll walk you through them. But in the meantime, I'm just going to do run after so that I can run all of the steps. In very brief, we'll do the installation. Then we'll load the model. We'll load the tiny Shakespeare data set. Then we'll run a quick test just to see that it generates some sensible uh, answers. Then we'll train Llama 2. And then we'll stream one more response just to see what kind of difference between before and after the training. Let's now just go through some of these different steps. First, we'll install some packages. We'll be using transformers from Hugging Face and also bits and bytes, which is going to allow us to run the model quantized in four bits instead of the usual 16. That means the model will be smaller, so it will fit in a smaller amount of memory, and that will allow us to use a free Collab notebook. Now, while that install is going, let me show you the loading. We're going to use Llama 2, um, the 7 billion model. Let me just increase my screen size here. So Llama 2 with the 7 billion model. And you can see here, we're going to load it in four bits. So that's going to be more compact. And that will allow us to save on memory. After the model is loaded, the next thing we do is we put on an adapter that is going to allow us to train. We're not actually going to train all of the parameters in the model. We're going to train a subset of those parameters. In fact, it'll be only about half a percent of the total parameters. And that will allow us to run the training a lot more quickly. And this method, which is called low rank adaptation, basically represents the full matrix in a much smaller compact form. And that more compact form allows us to save a lot of memory and computation during the training. Now you'll notice here, if you see a basic, uh, one of the free scripts for training, you'll see that the target modules are different. These modules have got different names for Llama than they do in other types of models. So I've made sure to put in the correct model, uh, the correct modules here that we're trying to target. This is a subset of the layers. Um, you can think of the parts of the overall model matrix. We're only going to train a subset. We're not going to train everything possible. Now, moving on, we're going to go to the loading of the tiny Shakespeare data set. Uh, you can check this out for yourself if you just want to go to Hugging Face and then go to data sets. And then if you put in here, tiny Shakespeare, this is the same data set that's used by Andre Carpathy. And it has a train and a test set. So we're going to train on 472 rows. They each have roughly about 1,000 tokens each. And the test set has 49 rows, also about 1,000 tokens each. This is publicly available. I'll put a link in the description. Once the data set is loaded, we'll run a test. 
And for that test, what we're going to do is take uh, out of the test data set, we're going to take the zeroth entry, which is the very first entry, and we will print that out. And then we're going to ask the model to stream the continuation. So we've got a simple streaming function here. Um, it will print out the very first uh, element in that test data set. So what we expect to see, um, unless, unless the data set is randomized, we would expect to see this uh, printed out and then it will continue on. After that, we'll then move to training of Lama 2. Uh, a few things that I wanna highlight here and some adjustments that I've made. I like including this evaluation data set, the eval data set, I'm using the test data set. What this gives us is an independent measure of the performance. One problem when you train is that you think the performance is getting better because your loss, uh, the loss of the model is improving, but you may just be fitting very closely word by word to the training data set. So if we have an independent data set that we don't use for training, we can independently measure the, the eval loss. And in that way, we're going to have a measure of performance. A few other notes here. The first time I run this loop, I'm just going to run it with one step, one training step. That'll be really fast, uh, but I can just see if it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, then I know there's an error and I can fix something before I invest a lot of time in doing a long training. Once that's done, I'll cancel it out and I'll just train for one epoch. Training for one epoch in this case means that we're gonna train with all 472 rows of the training data set. I've chosen here to have a batch size of four. So four of these examples here are packed in um, on every training iteration. They're uh, going to be computed in parallel. Now, this is quite efficient because every, on every training pass, you have to load the model weights into the GPU. And loading in the model weights would normally be about 13 gigabytes if that need to pass through the GPU. If you were um, doing 16-bit model, we're doing a 4-bit model, so it's probably only about uh, a quarter of that. So there's maybe about three and a half, four gigabytes that need to go through um, the GPU. Now, the GPU part that does the compute is actually quite small. It's only about 30 megabytes. So you can imagine that whole 3.5 gigabytes has to go in, get computed just piece by piece and keep flowing in. Now, the beauty of putting a batch size of four is that we load the weights once, and we compute four batches instead of just one. So we get more value every time that we load the model weights, we get four things done rather than one. So we want to have a batch size that's just large as possible. Um, but as we make the batch size larger and larger, that can also put a strain on the GPU. So there's some limit and you have to keep an eye just that uh, you're not going over the RAM. You can always take a look at that by clicking here. So we can see we've plenty of headroom so far in the training, 5.8, 15. So we could, you could experiment with an even larger batch size here, but I've got it for four. Uh, gradient accumulation. So the way training works is you forward pass through the model and you compute some outputs. You then compare them with what those outputs should have been. And then based on the difference in the two, you pass that backwards and adjust all the weights. And what gradient accumulation is saying is that we're going to actually do a pass forward on a batch of four, then another pass forward on a batch of four, then another pass forward on a batch of four, and then a fourth pass forward on a batch of four. And when that's all done, we will average out those uh, losses or average out the effects on the gradients. So basically we're averaging over four steps and this can make the training more smooth because it's kind of an average between four batches. Um, and it also means that you don't have to back propagate as often so you can save some compute from having to back propagate. Now, of course, if you accumulate many, many steps, then you're going to lose some of the nuance of your data set because you're just averaging across and you're not maybe getting um, more discretized information. So I've got that set at four. I have an evaluation strategy set here based on the number of steps. And what this 0 0.1 means is that every 10% of my data set I'm going to run a neat valuation. And you'll see that when we run a longer training. Right now my training has started, um, but it's only gonna run one step. In the future, we'll run a long training for a full epoch, and then we'll see the evaluation every 10% of the data. The warm-up ratio, um, this 
means that we're not going to start with a high learning rate. So the learning rate tells us for every step that we take towards the optimum, how much of a step do we take? Do we take a really large step or a really small step? So the step is two by 10 to the minus four. And the warm-up ratio is saying, well, we're not going to use that full step right at the start during the warm-up of two steps. We're going to use a smaller value. Okay. Um, so we are training in FP16. So this means using 16-bit. Uh, uh, what the bit and bytes approach does is it will dequantize on the fly, if I'm not mistaken. What that means is it allows us to store the data in four bits, and then when needed, it will expand that out to 16 uh, bits. And we have logging steps here of one, so we're going to log every step. And this is the output directory um, for the data. And here's the optimizer, which is um, basically a, very, a variant of simple gradient descent. Um, it involves the square of some past steps and also the value of some past uh, gradients. So it basically helps us to avoid really flat zones in the optimization curve or really jumpy zones. So Adam W is really common and Adam W 8-bit is an even simpler version uh, for lower amounts of bit, bits of compute. Okay, so here you can see we're currently operating on uh, the very first step. We're not going to be able to complete an epoch of training because it's just one step. Um, and here you can see it's calculating the validation loss. So we're running on a validate, an eval set as well as running on the trading set. So we get that independent measure of progress. Now, we're not really going to see progress here because we're just running one data point. So there's not going to be a second relative measure. But we can check that everything's working before running a full, um, a full analysis. Let's just scroll up here a little bit and see what the test says. It looks like um, it looks like here. Okay, so this is the first sample, and it is indeed Trainio. You can see it matches the test here, the very first uh, sample. So we have Trainio, and all of this here. And if we scroll down, remember it is a one thousand and twenty-four sample. You can see the end of the instruction here. That's a token that I've added. And here it's starting off again. Um, so it's continuing. So we have Gramio, Trenio, Petruccio, Battista, Gramio. So here's the continuation that the language model is currently doing. And you can see already without much fine tuning, it's uh, doing a reasonable job here. I mean, I'm not great at, at uh, Shakespeare, but that's what we have. So let's scroll down. And you can see here now we have a training loss and we have a validation loss. I don't think we can say much about the relative values. We can't see if they're going up or down. Um, but you can see that the evaluation has worked correctly. Um, we're going to install... Um, matplotlib. This is an issue you sometimes see where commands don't work in Google Collab. Uh, there is a fix, which is uh, this here. So we'll now install matplotlib. And that will allow us to do a plot here of the progress on training. So we need to just import one more thing. Okay, so here we need to import PLT. And we have here a plot. It's not going to be a good plot because we only have one data point. Um, but when we have more, that is going to plot. So let's go back up and adjust here, comment out the maximum steps. And we will go ahead and run transformers with the training. And after that's done, we'll be able to plot and we'll be able to stream an example. So we're training for a full epoch here, one epoch. And 
we will reconnect once that's done. Okay, folks, I'm back for some touch rugby training and the model has been running. You can see here that the training loss is going down and the validation loss is going down as well, which we love to see. This is a bit more clear uh, if we scroll down further to where we have a graph. Let me just uh, make that a bit more visible by returning to the original size. Here you can see the steps on the x-axis and the loss on the y-axis. The blue is the training, which is a little bit bumpy, as uh, typically is the case. And the, val the eval loss here on the test data set, you can see is moving down smoothly. It seems like it's maybe asymptoting. Now, what I'm thinking here is we've gone through one epoch, which means the model has seen all of the data set that I have, at least all the training set. And the eval loss, it seems to be plateauing. So my conclusion here is that it's probably going to be difficult to improve performance a lot more by using uh, this data set. Either I'd need to have maybe a larger data set, but even still, if the loss is flatlining, there might not be much more fine tuning we can do in the way of Shakespeare. And here I am just running inference after the training. You can see that, um, I've printed out here the same example as before the training. And then we're getting some inference here, which is consistent with the text before, at least roughly in terms of style. We have one of the characters that appeared before and we have some text that seems to be roughly in the Shakespeare style. So again, this, is not a great example that's easy to see by eye because Lama is quite familiar with uh, Shakespeare already. You can see there's some improvement according to the cross entropy loss. So I think it provides an instructive example of uh, training progressing. Um, but really, if you're fine tuning, you're going to be fine tuning because the model is not covering your current use case. And um, that's why you would do it in the first place. That's it for today's video on fine tuning for tone or style. Check out the description for some handy links and we'll see you next time.